The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. I'm Patrick, Head of Technology at professional services firm Collins SBA. I'm a former financial advisor who just loves solving business problems and creating better client experiences using technology. Join me each week as we unpack the tech on offer to advise professionals, stay on top of tech trends, and help you break free from the analysis paralysis experience when building and maintaining a great tech stack. Wealth is about more than just money. It's about opportunity and progress. NetWealth is supporting financial literacy and education in primary schools through Banker, a fun, interactive platform for children to learn about money. So far, we have sponsored and given over 100,000 children in Australia free access and want to reach even more. Discover a world of community at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. To give listeners of the Advice Tech Podcast another avenue to solve technology problems that matter most and efficiently evaluate the landscape of advice tech providers, Ensemble has launched an advice tech space on its platform. If you want to know how your advice peers are solving their tech challenges, big and small, it's the place to go. Head to the Ensemble platform or use the link in the show notes to join today. Today we're making compliance great again. It's an update episode with Eloise Summerford and Julia Vojkovic at Three Lines. So Three Lines is reg tech and it's here to help you run your AFSL. It takes out the guesswork, it creates consistency, allows you to ditch your register and file review spreadsheets and importantly enables you to build a compliance culture. And if you're a multi-service business or group, it can handle compliance outside the traditional AFSL requirements. So whether that's accounting, tax, investment, etc., And with all that data in one place or easily accessible, it's really exciting to see thoughtful and considered AI solutions come to life with the Three Lines Quick Vet on the way later this year. I started by asking Julia and Eloise what the oldest pieces of tech they own are and whether they still use it. I love this question. Um, So I recently rediscovered, and I feel like we're probably all around the same age, so we would understand, but I recently rediscovered my purple Lumix. And Pat, you're probably... Don't know the purple Lumix, um, perhaps a different color, but if you know, you know, it was the must have, you know, Y2K piece of tech, yeah. if you will. So it was a camera small enough to fit in your bag um, on a night out where you'd take, you know, 100 photos, instantly upload the whole lot to MySpace without a second thought. Um, but I was missing the cord, went to the cord, uh, you know, the, the random cord drawer where it's just a big bunch of mix up cords. You don't know where anything is you don't know what belongs to what but you don't want to throw anything out because if you throw something out the next day you'll need it and um yeah plugged her on in and went on a gloriously cringeworthy trip down memory lane so do I still use it absolutely not but it was definitely a you're saying why no so many reasons but it was a very nostalgic reminder of a very simple time no I I love (laughs) it I think you you're definitely discounting my ability to recall digicams. I'm actually a, a digicam enthusiast in the modern day. Like, had a nice red um, Nikon Coolpix, red. which bought from like a secondhand store, which was actually new. Um, it's a, I don't know, it's a great way to just capture moments instead of take a million photos on the iPhone or whatever device you're using. Yeah. So, very, very cool. Julie, have you got an oldest piece of tech that you own and whether you still use it? I. I sure do. I was going to say on, on the camera front, my husband recently gave our six-year-old daughter his old digital camera to play with, um, and she absolutely loves it. And I was just going to say to you, Elle, they're coming back around in fashion. I think all the young people are using digital cameras again, so you're coming back around. Um, <laughs> for me, I am still using my faithful 2003 model GHD hair straightener every day. Um, they certainly don't build them like they used to, so this piece of uh, this artifact from the olden days um, is still going strong. Now that I've said it out loud, though, I'm sure it probably won't turn on tomorrow morning, but it's my one thing that I still love from being young. 
I love it. No, that's fantastic. <laughs> and I guess, yeah, moving into, we've probably gone back 10, 20 years now, but moving into the modern days and maybe one or two ways that you're using <laughs> yeah. AI either personally or in your business life. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, AI is such an amazing tool um, and it can be used obviously both personally and professionally. Um, it's obviously super powerful, so you obviously need to be aware of its limitations. Um, and so while we do use it a significant amount in a professional capacity, we'll bore you with that a little bit later in this podcast, I'm thinking. Um, but personally, I love to use it as a tool just to assist in drafting any documents or pieces of writing. So whether it's, you know, an email or a letter um, and, you know, sometimes you get that touch of writer's block when you're not sure where to start. Um, so I feel like AI can give you a really great skeleton to leverage from when you're doing those types of things. I recently uh, helped my husband with a cover letter for a role that he was applying for and it just worked a charm. Um, what about you, Al? I was going to say, don't tell his his current workplace. <laughs> um, I'm going to geek out now. I um, Look, a while ago I set myself a task and this was sort of when we started using it professionally, um, but I set myself a task to use chat for everything seven days. So everything. So we already know, as Julia mentioned, it's a really powerful tool, but I was keen to get an understanding of what it does really, really well and uh, what it doesn't. So I used it, you know, recipes, emails to counsel, um, help a friend prepare for an interview, just a bunch of very, very, very random things. And this is in addition to how we were already using it uh, professionally. Um, and as Jim mentioned, and we will touch on this in a tick, but from a personal point of view, where there's you know not as much at stake, it did all of the above really well. So within the limited parameters of my requests of it. So I know my my kids do get a kick out of asking chat to create pictures of very very random things. So you know a mouse eating cheese on the Eiffel Tower and so on. But what we did find the other day is it does draw the line at <laughs> Trump wearing a tutu jumping on a trampoline. So that was really right. point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Interesting. No, it feels like um, a bit of an ode to Ratatouille there in terms of the the Paris example. But I think I know. I, know. I think that comes from my my grandma's influence on him. She's not French. She just wishes she was. <laughs> <Interesting>. <laughs> Great. And then yeah, also mentioning there things like letters to council. Like I assume there's lots of these sort of service organisations or. Uh, business institutions, et cetera, that are just feeling the wrath of AI-generated complaints and, and correspondence. Yeah, we were, even, we were even talking about that this morning. Elle sent through a interesting um, video where you can plug our chat GPT into Canva and create presentations and the like. And we were just discussing in our team like how, you know, unis and educational um, institutions will be dealing with that with students using it. So it's a real, I guess it's a really fast-paced world and um, I, a lot of, organizations will be finding it difficult to, to stay on top of it and to catch up to it. So thank you for sharing all of that. Um, it's an update episode today. And Julia, you're actually Advice Tech alumni from Advice Tech 45 <laughs> all the way back in July last year with Peter That's D. Correct. But today outnumbered uh, and a little bit nervous. So for those unfamiliar, <laughs> I'd love to get an overview of your professional origin stories, co-founding the business, so three lines, and how you arrived at the decision to build your own freaking AFSL compliance platform. Yes. <laughs> we ask ourselves that every day. Um, you know, we often do joke about being accidental tech entrepreneurs. Um, Ju and I had very similar backgrounds and we actually didn't cross paths until one fateful day many, many years later. So Ju kicked off her career at ASIC's grad program and working on a number of really high-profile investigations there. Well, I started in the big four consulting world at PwC, uh, EY and Deloitte. At some point, I'll, I'll round it out with KPMG, probably not. Um, but as luck would have it, uh, we then sort of simultaneously swapped sides. I joined ASIC, Drew moved to Deloitte, um, and our paths officially crossed when Macquarie Private Wealth brought us on board during their enforceable undertaking. So that was around... I think 2013, 2014, and we both actually applied for the same role of compliance manager in Perth. And uh, the state manager at the time, Tony Monaco, we, you know, shout out to him. Um, he couldn't choose between us and it was probably due to the fact that we had the exact same experience. Um, so he hired us both. And I think, yeah, that was really one of many sliding doors moments for us. It absolutely was. Um and people used to say to us, oh, did you guys know each other prior to starting at Macquarie? And 
we said, no, we've just met, but we've become the best of friends in the first 10 minutes of starting our roles there. So we really are, it's like a perfect match. Um, but working at Macquarie was really our first opportunity to experience firsthand how a big firm, a big AFSL like Macquarie could struggle to balance compliance with being commercial. Um, and it made us really wonder, you know, if Macquarie, if a big AFSL like Macquarie is finding it tough, how are small self-licensed firms even surviving out there? Um, and we realized that the tools that were being used in the industry at, at that time, like, you know, clunky yet incredibly costly Salesforce systems, um, like we were using at Macquarie, they just weren't fit for purpose. So that drove us um, actually out to both resign from Macquarie at the same time. And we set up our own compliance consulting business called Compliance Code. And, and we found that our business and our workload grew pretty quickly starting our consulting business. And um, it was safe to say that the admin part of the business was eating away out of us eating away at us. So we were managing our growing client base with managing, you know, different spreadsheets, advisor reviews, compliance committee meetings, registers, remediation tasks, um, but all between all of our clients. So you name it, we were losing track of it. And we knew our clients were also losing track of those types of uh, functions within their business as well. Um, So naturally, we started looking for an off-the-shelf solution that could handle all of these tasks and functions for us. Um, and every solution that we looked at at the time was either too complex or too expensive or it only solved part of the problem but didn't um, give us a sort of holistic compliance framework to work with. Um, and we didn't want to manage a growing tech stack. We didn't want to have, you know, seven different systems to sort of report to. So we made the bold decision to step out on our own and develop our own platform. So um, initially we started building that as in it was just meant to be an internal tool for ourselves to use um, so that we would free up more of our own time so that we could spend more time face-to-face with our clients. Um, we thought it would be a pretty quick project, maybe just a couple of months to build a basic system that was you know, <laughs> functional but not necessarily pretty to look at. Um, I feel like, and uh, from then, yeah, things escalated. It really escalated. <laughs> <laughs> as it always does. <laughs> um, and look, I think, sorry to cut you off, Julie, but I think then, okay. you know, it's just a, you know, it, it, I keep saying, you know, something unexpected happened, but something always unexpected happens in startup. And now a client started to ask us how we were managing reports and remediation so efficiently. And, you know, they they saw value in the tool that we'd built and it sort of made us realize then that we had actually designed something really special. So um, I think it was probably around five years ago now that we decided to pivot and rebuild the platform from scratch from scratch without our clients' needs in mind, you know, keeping in mind that the previous platform was built with our consulting needs in mind. So this was the first of two full rebuilds. Um, Look, this time, yeah, as I mentioned, you know, we focused on creating a solution for the smaller self-licensed practitioners, so the little guys who did need help navigating compliance, didn't have the resources, so didn't have the time, didn't have the money, and didn't necessarily, you know, have the desire to be spending half their time on compliance. So, um, again, something unexpected happened. Um, and, you know, as we were completing the rebuilds so that we were coming to, to launch date, Findex Group actually approached us and signed on as our first subscriber. So, <laughs> Findex had, you know, hundreds of users. While this rebuild uh, was initially designed for those self-licensed firms. So, this was really, I guess, you know, what we would call a defining moment for oh, us. Definitely. And yeah, personally and professionally. Um, yeah, so although our platform was designed for smaller operations, what we did discover, you know, during onboarding Findex and in the first few months of them using the system was that it it could really handle the needs of much larger groups. So I, I guess that's why, you know, I guess it's because at its core, it's really focused on a licensee's general obligations, which we know are universal across all AFSLs. Um, so it was really working. It was really working from the one-man bands all the way up to the Findexes of this world. So, um, you know, I guess to wrap it up, while we still have three lines consulting, three lines legal, you know, our in boot camp, that forms part of our group of companies. As the platform really, you know, at that point, that was the tipping point, started to take off uh, and things grew exponentially. We now have other business partners that that manage these functions, which has allowed Jill and I, to focus our attention solely on the platform. And that's probably how we became accidental tech entrepreneurs. We'll awesome. always laugh about. <laughs> no, very cool. And, yeah, shout out to Tony all the way back at Macquarie going with the old El Paso approach there of why don't we oh. have both. 
Um, Get on those dogs. <laughs> exactly. Yes. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so, and and obviously you've you've built incredible scale into the platform as you sort of mentioned there with the big end of town knocking on the door early on. Do you mind maybe giving us an idea of I guess the platform in terms of maybe key functionality, like an overview from that perspective, maybe what it was and maybe what it is now. Yeah, absolutely. So in summary, it's a platform um, which is a SaaS solution, so software as a service. It's crafted to streamline compliance management for AFSLs, um, and it enables users to easily oversee their general obligations, ensure that they are maintaining a robust compliance framework and enhancing their processes. Um, it's designed to be used across an entire firm. So every member from your, you know, your administrators to your advisors or you know, your representatives um, your responsible managers, board members, even compliance teams, um, all of those people are users of the system and they actively contribute to maintaining the compliance of the business. Um, and this clarity allows everyone to understand their responsibilities and also to stay accountable to them. Um, and there are activities automated to according to the firm's compliance framework. So the platform supports various functions that a licensee needs to do in order to maintain their general obligation compliance, um, including professional year management, hosting their compliance committee meetings, uh, undertaking advisor reviews, complaints reporting, reg updates, attestations, much more and much more than that. Um, and we've built it to eliminate the need for a complicated compliance tech stack. So it truly makes it a one-stop shop for licensees in managing their compliance framework. So this year we have rebuilt the platform from the ground up and we launched what we call Three Lines 2.0 earlier this year. Um, and we're so happy with this new iteration of the product. Um, it retains all of the successful base elements that were part of our old system, but it also includes more enhanced functionality, which was built um, based on subscriber feedback and it removes some of the ineffective components that clients weren't really finding as much value in. So we know that we have a product that really, really aligns with what licensees need and want to run a successful and compliant business. The rebuild that we've just done also aligns with our business model of um, doing a comprehensive rebuild or redevelopment of the system every five years. Um, and the new version of the system also includes what we call a light version. So um, that offers essential functionality to licensees to sign up completely free of charge. So um, we hope that that will entice a lot of people into the platform. We often get questions from prospects about what are the hidden costs associated with that so with that offering. Um, but licensees can rest assured there aren't any. It's truly a free product that they can get um, limited use of the system um, for as long as they want. Um, and then additionally, we have um, a premium and, and, and enterprise version of the platform with more extensive capabilities um, for licensees to use if they wanted the full functionality of the platform. Um, and overall, you know, the version 2.0 of Three Lines, it just provides greater flexibility for us and for our subscribers without adding any unnecessary complexity. Amazing. No, thank you for that overview. And yeah, it's, it's clear that you've got um, something for everyone when it comes to all shapes and sizes of licensees. So I actually set up an account earlier this week, uh, no credit card required. So it's clean, it's straightforward. It was just easy, which must be a breath of fresh air for compliance teams and everyone around them. And I think especially, you know, I mentioned enterprise, but if you're going out on your own from an AFSL or a licensing perspective, this feels absolutely essential. So from day one, you're avoiding the spreadsheets and the inconsistencies and just creating a great <laughs> compliance culture. Um, have you, do you mind sort of expanding on maybe some of the, you know, a case study or two? You mentioned a couple of yeah. firms there before, but maybe what compliance life was like for them before and what it is now using the platform? Yeah, I think, look, I think we, I touched on Findex before and, and I'll, I'll take it sort of, you know, from one extreme to the other. So I'll start with Findex. You know, as we mentioned, they played a really crucial role in developing our first client-facing platform. Um, and when we initially onboarded them, we integrated you know, customized functionality for them. So I mentioned general obligations before and and that's how we knew that it was going to work for all sizes. But obviously within the framework, there's um, different ways that say a smaller licensee will have to be able to fulfill their obligations in comparison to a Findex. Uh, so we did uh, customize functionality in their account to enhance primarily their monitoring and supervision program. So particularly how they manage their advisor reviews. And the process was was previously handled manually. And we know how painful that is because that's what we were doing prior to, to launching the platform initially. So 
They had hundreds of advisors, limited compliance resources, and in meeting KPIs, it's just, um, you know, it's fraught with danger, certainly if ASIC were to come knocking. So we successfully were able to preserve their audit question set. We do have preloaded question sets in there, but that was really something that was important to them. And, um, you know, while eliminating the administrative burden associated with conducting the reviews. So they still had that framework, but we just took away the administration. So we removed the spreadsheets, removed the, you know, cumbersome report formatting. And most importantly, it meant that they could then facilitate the resolution of any limitations that were coming out of those reviews um, through the task management system. So advisors then had a dedicated space where they could access the required tasks, the deadlines, the reasons behind the limitations or why they were asking the questions they were asking. So they would see the task, what they had to do, the regs that it's based on, when it's due, everything's in one place. Um, and that really significantly, you know, obviously improved the quality oversight function. Um, and now they've expanded under three lines 2.0 uh, to include their other service lines, so accounting and tax and their investment platform. And uh, now they're all separate accounts and, and they have their own bespoke functionality um, in accordance with their, their various frameworks. Yeah, and um, and that, I guess that's, that's the larger end of town. On the smaller side, um, I don't necessarily want to name names, but we know that our meeting functionality, so compliance committee meetings, CCMs, uh, registers, and the advisor review functionality has been a game changer. And we've worked with sole practitioners, you know, for a decade who, for example, conduct CCMs, CC, CCMs independently. So often without any guidance or, um, you know, they're unsure if they're asking the right questions. They're, they're basically, you know, flying blind. So um, they're operating in the dark for these firms, the automatic inclusion of reg updates, and they flow through to meetings and advisor reviews and things like that throughout the platform along with the guidance that's in the platform, not only saves them time, but it actually allows them to do what we hoped they would do in the start and refocus their efforts back on serving their clients. So we focus on serving them and then they can in turn go back to serving their clients. Perfect. And I guess, as you mentioned before, that really helps with, I guess, adding the uh, or getting that right balance between compliance and commerciality, as you mentioned before. And as it's tight, you- right. Clear, yeah, exactly. And you're clearly expanding um, outside AFA cells as well, right? Like in terms of that fitness example, there's is it APES or APES standards and, and you've built the platform in a way where, once again, scalable to manage your every uh, compliance need there, which is fantastic. And you also mentioned around advisor reviews being a game changer. Do you, do you think there's maybe anything else, and sorry for this question without notice, but anything else that's particularly time-consuming uh, as part of the compliance component of running, running an AFSL? Like it feels like IDR would be up there. <laughs> Absolutely. So IDR, IDR is, you know, it's our, it's our baby. <laughs> we took <laughs> months interpreting the regs. It's a bit sad, isn't it? If Jul- Julia and I would have it sounds yeah, um, only nerdy you know. Cut out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, we did spend so long interpreting the regs and making sure that the IDR register was fit for purpose and made things so much more simple. Took away the coding and everything that you need when you're you know generating the report for ASIC, so that our clients and this is a plug here, but it's on the free system. So if you are um, yeah, logging into Three Lines Light, the free subscription. You'll be able to utilize all of these features anyway. Um, but we wanted to take away that coding and all the convoluted regs that ASIC has put into this whole IDR reporting regime <laughs> and just make it a whole lot more simple. So even if you had one, if, you, if we're talking about a small licensee that had one complaint that they had to report on, um, that is just so time-consuming interpreting yeah. those regs. Definitely. And it doesn't help when, I guess, ASIC's definition of a complaint is simply an expression 
of dissatisfaction. <laughs> and I actually, I don't know why I was doing this, but I had to look at the IDR data reporting handbook, 99 pages by ASIC, which half of it is actually how to well. use Excel, um, which I thought was quite entertaining but and just quite ironic. But in terms of, yeah, the fact that it's an expression of dissatisfaction. So a client doesn't even have to say that I'm complaining or say I'm making Correct. a complaint. It's an expression of dissatisfaction. And it can also be in relation to the handling of a complaint. So they can complain about the complaint. Yes. So Perfect. I assume having that one system, which then translates into the 26 plus fields that are involved with the, obviously the IDR, which are probably for those playing at home, internal dispute resolution, it just makes it a lot simpler. And as you mentioned, the, the you know, all it takes is one complaint for that submission to be made. And I guess it's every six months, is that right as well, to the ASIC portal? Correct. And it's, uh, and you know, it's not just the, the 26 fields or what have you, but it's all of the conditional validation and um, machine. Yeah, that's really where yeah. people get caught out is, you know, if you're answering this to this, then you need to be answering that to that. So it, it's very complex. And I really feel for licensees, certainly given um, the handbook has directed people, as you mentioned, to use spreadsheets, which is fraught with, with danger. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. And I guess with, um, you know, going from going from spreadsheets to regtech, not sure if that's a great transition, but with, with reg, regtech as a whole evolving rapidly, particularly I would say from an advice file review uh, perspective, what's been the approach there? Uh, to staying ahead of the curve and continuing to innovate with three lines. Absolutely. So staying ahead in reg tech really requires, we found it really requires it be a balance between innovation, but also maintaining a really strong and secure foundation. So for us, as I mentioned earlier, we have a business model where every five years we completely redevelop the platform from the ground up. So this allows us to stay in tune with the latest advancements uh, in, you know, coding and the like and servers and all that jazz, but also ensuring that we are building on a solid yet modern foundation. So, um, and I guess, you know, innovation isn't also just about the big overhauls. Between those cycles, we're constantly evolving too. So to do this effectively, we've structured our team to have two distinct focuses. So one half works on platform support to make sure everything is running smoothly day to day. And then the other half of the team is really dedicated to pushing forward and looking, you know, and building new features and improvements within the platform. So, um, and to do that, we really rely heavily on feedback from our white label accounts. So these are accounts owners who are acting as our, I guess, eyes on the ground. They are other independent and external consulting and legal firms who use the three lines platform uh, to manage their own client accounts. So in a consulting uh, point of view, I guess. Um, their reach and their insights really give us a clear picture of what's working well and what we need to improve on. So um, I guess while innovation is key, we're always really careful to walk the line between being on the front foot and also not compromising on security or risk mitigation. I guess it's just finding that sweet spot between um, we're not just advancing, but we're also safeguarding the platform as well. Lovely. And I guess for those maybe I don't know, unfamiliar with RegTech solutions? Is there any advice or tips you'd give to businesses or firms just beginning to sort of look into compliance tech? Yeah, I think people that are just starting out and are just, you know, have just got their license, they're in a they're in a great place because they can build from the ground up and they don't have to strip anything back. So for firms starting to explore compliance tech, our advice would be to to really, you know, sit back and consider the tech stack as a whole rather than just adding layers to fix immediate needs. Um, you know, it's easy to fall into the trap of tacking on solutions, but that can really lead to complexity and inefficiencies, and that's really counterproductive. So especially when you have multiple sources of truth, which, you know, from our time at ASIC, and we've seen it a lot, and, you know, again, it was one of those catalysts that led us to developing three lines, was, um, you know, having multiple sources of truth and how, you know, things can turn turn bad swiftly. And um, so we've also seen, you know, talking about tacking on this play out with ASIC, you know, and in regulation, they, you know, it's no secret that they tack on and on to outdated regs without really taking the time and doing the industry research to really reassess the entire framework and see what's working and what isn't. And it's really created this patchwork that doesn't always work cohesively. And I think tech stacks probably have followed along with that in them adding and adding and adding, so the tech stack grows and grows and grows. Um, so sometimes you need to really just take a step back, take a broader look at your requirements, and even be open to just another way 
of doing things. And as I mentioned before, new AFSLs have the benefit of being able to design, you know, exactly how they want their compliance framework or their compliance tech stack to look without having to unwrap these layers that may have been built over time. And, you know, that's not to say that three lines is the answer for every business, but it does mean that firms should invest the time to get their ducks in a row. So, and just think about, you know, a short-term gain isn't necessarily worth, you know, the long-term pain um, of a disjointed tech stack. Um, And you're a techie, you would know all about this, but taking it, you know, a more holistic approach will certainly save a lot of pain and, and probably money down the track. Oh, and just the, I'm totally with you and just the, the change fatigue, the change management that all teams go through and, you know, just getting comfortable with the process and then it changes, et cetera. Like I think, once again, a testament to the approach that you've taken in terms of how simple and clean and easy it is to, to use a platform. And I guess just on the, you know, talking about tacking it on and short-term solutions, I guess <laughs> with, with AI playing an increasingly bigger role in reg tech, uh, and in financial planning or financial advice in general, do you see that fitting into compliance for AFSLs? sales? Like what, what potential do you see? Any risks? What are your top tips there? What do you see there? Oh, yeah, and it already is. It, it's already certainly playing a big role. Um, it's making waves in reg tech. And the potential for AFSLs sales is huge. And, and we all know that, especially when it comes to streamlining compliance and reducing the manual workload. AI can definitely help analyze large volumes of data in real time. So it can flag potential compliance breaches and predict issues before they arise. For AFSLs, this means, you know, less time spent on the tedious tasks that nobody wants to do, like sifting through reports or monitoring changes to regs manually. And and I guess then be able to spend more time on that strategic decision making and more time with their clients. So there's also a lot of caution. And I think that goes without saying around AI, and rightly so, it's powerful, um, but it's not a magic bullet. And and we're very aware of that. So one of the risks, I think, is relying just too heavily on AI and not having that balance um, without understanding its limitations, certainly when it comes to compliance. So if the data feeding into the AI model is flawed, the insights will be too, plus we can't, you know, ignore the reg and security risks involved. So data privacy, accuracy, the potential for bias uh, are things that we definitely have to be and continue to be very, very mindful of. Yeah, if I can jump in there, we're actually um, experimenting with AI at the moment. We're, of course, as Elle mentioned, very aware of the um, immense capabilities, but also going to continue to put the privacy, confidentiality and security of our clients first, um, rather than develop just based on what our competitors might be up to or might be doing. Um, it's important that we develop efficiencies using tools that guarantee our clients' data would not be used by any, say, AI service providers to train their models or to be stored or retained in any way. Um, but I guess that being said, we really do see AI as a tool to enhance and not replace human judgment. And, uh, and we're currently exploring how AI could help our su- subscribers automate prevents as a starting point. So uh, we're being very careful not to be over-reliant on it. Um, but we are looking to launch our new functionality called Quick Vets uh, in October or November this year. So this will be a tool that will strengthen our current monitoring and supervision toolkit. Um, and it will add a first step for advisors to conduct an instantaneous review of advi- an advice document prior to the you know pre-existing pre-vet or advisor reviews that we have in three lines. So we're really excited about this um, and yeah, can't wait to bring it to the platform. That is very, very intriguing. So really bringing a, a even more of a proactive approach to compliance, right, in terms of the, the classic sort of post-vet file review. Absolutely. Yeah, we've seen a real trend towards pre-vets over the last few years. So there's proactive reviews of advice documents prior to the advice going to the client. Um, and that also, you know, that obviously works in conjunction with a, a balance of retrospective reviews of client files in their entirety as well. But um, definitely the proactive reviews have really become more popular. And so this is just another step towards, I guess, reviewing advice and looking for any, I guess, red flags or anywhere that an advisor may have gone off track by accident prior to advice going to the client. So prior to an issue becoming, say, an incident or a breach after the fact. So yeah, we're super excited about our quick bets. Lovely. No, that's fantastic and very exciting. Oh, sorry. I was just saying good plug. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So I guess, and just on the, I'm totally with you with the AI um, comments there. And also it feels like, you know, I mentioned sort of IDR before, that feels like peak 
AI territory. Like AI is fantastic at picking up sentiment. So rather than someone manual who might be being complained against going, oh, is this a complaint? Do I want to put this on the register and dob myself in? That's probably where something objective like AI could could uh, step in and say yay or nay from a, um, an IDR or a, a uh, complaint perspective. I mean... Yeah, absolutely. And I think also we've seen it um, and we've had, you know, we're always asking and looking for feedback from our subscribers and a big one has been around meetings as well and that goes back to the administrative burden of you know typing out minutes for your CCMs and now we you know we have this platform to conduct meetings and we have the guidance and the agendas and the remediation that can come out of that but I think certainly and we're hoping by December that um, AI could play a role as well in um, some minutes and, and things like that in our, our meeting module. Love it. And you're obviously translating to maybe automated action items and tasks and just reducing some of that manual load that's very exciting, especially when, you know, the compliance meeting is over. It's like it's not really over. That's where the work begins, right? Like there's stuff to do. Exactly. And that's sort of like that was another catalyst for us starting because we would, um, you know, we had a, a growing client base and we would get to the day before the CCM and think, well, what were our action items leading into this meeting? So we thought if we're – flailing about and um, then you know AFSLs must be as well. So. Yeah no I know exactly what you mean and I guess you mentioned sort of getting a lot of feedback from users um, in the past have you got maybe uh, a couple of lessons that you've learned while working on the latest version of the platform anything you want to share there? <laughs> yeah absolutely so redesigning the platform has felt at times like taking on a home renovation you know you'll you'll you know it'll be worth it in the end but there are definitely times throughout the process where you're knee deep in the design and the development and you're wondering what you've signed up for um but when it comes to our industry we've learned so much about AFSLs and what their pain points are especially obviously around risk and compliance um and in our years since founding three lines um, we learned that what may be a small pain this week will morph into an even bigger beast next week or may even make way for a completely unrelated problem for a licensee the week after that. So um, I guess currently what we know, one of the biggest issues that licensees are facing is having multiple disconnected systems that don't speak to each other and teams who are toggling between, you know, using spreadsheets and third-party apps and internal databases and trying to make sense and, of it all and join all that information together. Um, and we know that that can be very inefficient and frustrating and it can lead to the dreaded problem of having multiple sources of truth and not knowing, you know, where the truth actually lies. Um, so, and we felt like in our old version of the platform, we didn't tackle that problem as well as we could have. So the latest version, so 3 Lives 2.0, really keeps that um, having one source of truth as front of mind um, in both of our premium functionality and also in its ability to adapt to a firm's unique compliance framework um, under what would be an enterprise subscription as well. Mm. And I think and, and I think this sort of goes without saying as well, another key pain point would be the sheer volume of reg change. So AFSLs are constantly trying to to keep up, but the fragmented systems that they rely on just make it harder than it needs to be. And Julia mentioned, you know, we we may not have done that as well in our in our last platform. So there were things missing that did require AFSLs to have other, um, you know, pieces of tech in the stack. Um, so this, you know, now we don't necessarily, you know, want our subscribers to be working with outdated tools, which aren't scalable, um, leaving the teams again, overstretched and stressed. It goes against everything, you know, that we based our first design on. So redesigning three lines has really been about addressing these issues head on and streamlining compliance, bringing all the critical pieces under one roof and continuing to cut down the time that AFSLs spend on that admin and manual reporting. So, you know, we always say we haven't reinvented the wheel. We've just given it a really good greasing. <laughs> and it's always, you know, it's always going to be a moving beast to keep up with the current fears, current desires of our industry and redevelopment Julia mentioned has its challenges, but making sure we're solving these problems and balancing that innovation with security is really is really key for us. So at the end of the day, it's all worth it when we know we've created something that directly tackles the day to day frustrations of AFS licensees and um, and that we can make their lives a little easier. Awesome, no, I love it, and yeah, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate the conversation and you know making compliance great again. I mean, is there <laughs> What, what's the what's the best what's the best way to learn more about three lines or progress the conversation? How has there been two 
Trump references in a podcast about <laughs> AFSL slide. So it's good pickup. Um, you know, look, I think you know we've made it very easy for licensees to sign up for a free account uh, in under under a minute. Just visit our website or www.threelines.com.au slash platform or you can just Google Three Lines Platform and follow the link to sign up for a free light account. And this means firms can start today with their IDR register. You know, you mentioned that's a big one. Uh, you can get started today and, um, you know, when the time comes, generate that report for ASIC through our free account and along with other compliance registers, policy hosting, reg updates and, and more. So it's all included in the light subscription. And if users find they want to go ahead and manage the entire framework in the system, so a one-stop shop, they can effortlessly upgrade um, right from within that light account. So we offer month-to-month billing with no locking contracts. Um, so it's really simple, it's really flexible for firms to you know, choose the level of service that you know, will fit their needs and will work for them. Awesome. Eloise, Julia, thank you again. And for our listeners, see you in the advice tech space. Thanks, Patreon.